Good morning. Uh, Alan Revere is in Cuba today, so he won't be with us. But he laid out the service ahead of time. I'd like to begin in an unusual way this morning. There are a couple of new songs on your insert, and when we come to them, it would be nice if you'd already know them. So I'd like to teach them to you at this point. A great way to memorize scripture is to sing it, and this is from Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace. I'll sing it, and then we can all sing it, and it'll become yours.
morning, everyone. Thanks for being here today. A special welcome to our dean and students. Um, nice to have a week where we're not worried about the cold. I guess we substituted the rain. Uh, but welcome to Cleveland in the in the winter. Uh, we'll start with the uh, call to worship. Jesus said, "I am giving you peace. I give you my peace, not the peace that the world that the world offers." but it is my peace. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. The Lord will keep those in perfect peace, whose minds are set on ground. Those who live in the secret place of the Most High shall find rest under the shadows of the Almighty. Let us proclaim that the Lord is our refuge and our fortress. Let us trust in the Lord. Now may the God will fill us with complete joy
going to read uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors, just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God, as the people of Israel did, we will fall. Well, good morning. It's good to be here. My name's Josiah. Welcome, Demon students. Um, I'm excited about this morning. I've been I've been thinking about it really since uh, the end of August when Dr. Bevere uh, let us know that our theme for this academic school year uh, was going to come from Psalm 34, verse 14. And I want to read that for you. Uh, the, the verse 14 of Psalm 34 says, Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And as we've been looking at this verse throughout this, this chapel, uh, or throughout chapel this school year, the, our emphasis has been on seek peace and pursue it. And when I heard that theme, I immediately had the sense that this is an appropriate theme for us in light of some of our social and political and cultural dynamics that we have going on all around us. As, as people who are stud studying to be uh, ministers of God, it just makes sense that we should be people who are thinking about seeking peace and pursuing it. But what's interesting is that when I heard that verse read back in August in that first chapel, chap uh, chapel when Dr. Bevere read it, the thought that went off in me was, I think I've been seeking and pursuing peace my entire life. But not the kind of peace that comes from exterior conflict. I guess I need to stand for the microphone. The kind of peace that comes from interior trouble. You know, that inward peace, that inward sense of shalom. Um, I think even from some of my earliest memories, there was this sense that there was something that I was looking for that I didn't necessarily have. A longing for an ability to say, it is well with my soul. Um, in a journey group last night, we were we were enjoying some readings from Henry now. And it's interesting to me to think about a minister like Henry Nowen, who had so much influence and who was so widely read, but he was a man, he was a minister who was definitely on the journey seeking and pursuing peace. He wasn't one who would say that every day when he woke up in the morning, his head popped, popped off the pillow and he thought, man, it's well with my soul. You know, he was somebody who was seeking and pursuing a sense of inward peace and inward shalom. And so when I think about us as ministers or soon-to-be ministers, I know that we are the people who very often are carrying not only some of our own troubles and encountering some things in our own lives that can lead to a lack of peace, but we also carry some of those burdens that others carry, and they can bring into our hearts a sense of unrest, a sense of turmoil, a sense of it is not well our souls. And, uh, you know, a thought that strikes me regarding all of this um, is that very often our internal environment is projected out into our external environment. And so if we want to be a people who can actually bring peace and seek to bring peace into our external environment, it's important that we also be a people who are seeking and pursuing peace within. Um, in James uh, chapter 4, James draws the reader's attention to the fact that it's very often our own inward desires, our own inward sense of there's something that I want that I don't have, or there's an inward tension that's at play that can often lead to conflict in our external environments. Um, I'm just assuming that you can relate to this because um, when I look at many of the ministers of the gospel down through the ages, I see a, a people I see men and women who are very honest about being on the way. Being a pilgrim people who had not necessarily arrived at a sense of, it's always well with my soul. But now I see the men and 
women of God that are part of the great cloud of witnesses that we're joined with as being a people who were in pursuit of something. It's not that it was something that they had to attain, but they were in pursuit of entering into a rest that had been provided for them. Uh, when I think about some of the things that can steal my peace, you know, I'm, a, I'm about to graduate in the spring, and I know some of my other classmates are as well, and when we start thinking about questions of ministry calling and what our purpose is and where we'll be next in our lives, that can bring a sense of te tension and turmoil. Um, oftentimes it's interpersonal relationships or it's uh, conflicts that we might have in ministry leadership where there are difficult personalities that we have to interact with and that can bring a sense of tension. But whatever it is that steals our peace, I believe it's important that we come to scripture and we ask, how can we seek and pursue inward peace for ourselves? So that we can be a people who bring peace to our external environments, but also so we can just be a people who are well, a people who are at rest. So as I've brought this, this question to scripture, how do we seek and pursue peace? There's one salient theme that has come out of scripture and spoken to my heart, and it certainly isn't the end of the story on what it means to find peace with God. Uh, there are tomes and tomes that have been written on this subject. But as I've approached scripture uh, here recently, what I've come to see is this, that what we believe particularly about God has a profound impact on whether or not we will enter into an experience of peace. Let me just say that one more time. What we believe particularly about God, has a profound impact on whether or not we will enter into an experience of peace. Uh, there's a quote by A.W. Tozer in his book, Knowledge of the Holy, that I want to share with you. And Tozer says this, he says, With the goodness of God to desire our highest welfare, and the wisdom of God to plan it, and the power of God to achieve it, what do we lack? Surely we are the most favored of all creatures. With the goodness of God to desire our highest welfare, the wisdom of God to plan it, and his power to achieve it, like surely we don't like anything. We're the most blessed among creatures. And that's true, right? But I don't always believe those things. <laughs> and it's there that my peace can get stolen. In those places where I fail to recognize and I fail to believe in those deep places of my heart that God is good and that God is wise, and that God is powerful to bring about good ends out of messy situations. Um, there are two places that I'm going to take us in Scripture this morning as we look at this. And the first place is Genesis. And we're going to briefly look at the creation and the fall narrative. But then also Hebrews chapter 3 and chapter 4. And in both places I believe that we see that experiencing peace and shalom is attached to to what we believe about God. So, I'm not going to read the creation narrative because I'm in a, I feel like I'm in a room of people who are quite acquainted with this. So I, I hope that you'll give me some liberty of breezing through in different places and speaking in broad terms about a narrative that you know quite well. But the creation narrative is marked by peace and order that comes out of disorganization and chaos. I learned that on day one of OT class with Dr. Hawk. And, and in this text, we have a sense of Adam and Eve at rest in the garden with provision. They are taken care of. The Father says, or God says, freely eat. This is for you. There is a space in which provision has been made for them to exist and their physical and their emotional, and we'll say spiritual needs are met in relationship with the Father and through dependence upon Him. I love in Genesis 3, this is after the fall has happened, but we hear that God comes walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And I just like that little detail. It makes me wonder if that was a regular occurrence. Did God often walk through the garden in the cool of the day at a particular time, just looking for Adam and Eve, wanting to spend time with them? Who knows? But what we can tell from the narrative is that there was peace, there was shalom, there was rest, there was well-being, they had purpose, they had connection. 
But then we see that that was disrupted, and it was disrupted very, very quickly. And I'm convinced that peace and shalom was disrupted by something other than sin. It was disrupted by sin, eventually. But the first thing that disrupted shalom was a question and a lie. The first thing that disrupted shalom was the introduction of doubt into the human heart and into our narrative. The introduction of doubt. Did God really say, did God really say that you couldn't eat from any of the fruit in the garden? What kind of God is that? There's all this fruit, and he said that you couldn't eat from it. Is God withholding? And Eve quickly sets the serpent straight, but then the serpent follows it up with, you will not surely die, for God knows that if you eat of that fruit, you're going to be like him. And the subtext to that is, God doesn't want you to be like him. Which is a completely different narrative than, you are special and you are made in the image of God. Two counter narratives. Instead of, God is generous, freely eat, we now have, God is withholding, can you trust him? Do you really want to entrust your well-being fully and completely to a God like this? I would even, Adam, if I were you, I'd, I'd think this through a little bit. You're not going to die. You're actually going to finally become what you were always created to be, as if they weren't always, as if they weren't already on the way to becoming who they were always created to be in the presence of the Father. A counter-narrative that entered and stole peace I wonder how often in our lives we experience the same kind of thing at work in our lives, where we're walking along and then a counter-narrative enters our lives and all of a sudden peace is stolen. It's interesting to me that before Adam and Eve ate the fruit, which is usually, at least in my past, what I attributed the whole fall to, it's like, you hear the crunch of the apple and all of a sudden, like, Demons pop out of corners, the sun goes behind a cloud, everything changes because that fruit got bitten into. But the reality of the matter is this, peace was already disrupted. Adam and Eve were already separated from God in a sense because of what they believed about God. <coughs> Adam and Eve didn't go running to the Father to say, somebody told me something crazy about you and I just need to check with you to find out if this is real. No. They were already saying, wait a second, I'm troubled. I am, there is not peace here because I am questioning who God is. How often is the same true of us? Your peace, my peace can be stolen in the same way as a serpent slithers into our lives, sells us a bill of goods, and steals our peace. I wonder what the lies are that he uses to steal your peace. Maybe something like, you're on your own. You know you're on your own, right, in this ministry? Nobody else is coming to help you. And if this thing is going to succeed, it's on you. And unless you really bust your behind, there's no way that your church is ever going to be as successful or your ministry is going to be as significant as the church down the street. Or... You know, you're really not enough, and you never have been. But if you did a little bit more, if you worked a little bit harder, maybe if you had a little bit more success here and there, maybe <coughs> then you could be somebody. There are many lies that can enter into our hearts that cause us to hustle. They bring us out of a place of peace, and soon we're working and reaching and grabbing and striving and achieving in order to gain that which was freely given in the garden. We're hustling, we're working sometimes, we're, we're in ministry sometimes trying to prove things that need not be proven. And instead of ministering from a place of peace, where we have this deep sense that we're the beloved of God and He just delights in us and He loves us, and all is well, and we can go out and serve the people of God with joy and gladness, sometimes we're thinking, this is going to be the context where I can actually find peace by finally doing enough 
to feel like I've done enough, to finally make a big enough impact to get away from the fears that I might have. Lies that enter our narrative. Lies that affect the way we see God can, can steal our peace. You know what? I believe that it's the cross of Jesus Christ that stands as a signpost driven deeply into the ground that declares the truth that can drive away the lies that steal our peace. I've been thinking about this. What it is that the cross declares. I'll, I like to think of it as a signpost that it's driven into the ground and there is Jesus hanging on the cross and he's declaring loudly on that sign, on that cross, the truths that can destroy these counter narratives. Truths like God so loved the world. The cross declares that he's not abandoned us. The cross declares that we have worth and value in the eyes of our Father. We have a worth that far exceeds anything that the world would, anything that we would ascribe to ourselves. The cross declares that sin and brokenness that we might experience today doesn't have to have the final say in our lives. The cross loudly and forcefully speaks against all counter narratives that drive inner turmoil in our lives. But we have to believe it. <laughs> we have to believe it. I think sometimes to believe it, what we have to do is we have to just sit down in front of it and marinate in truth and behold truth long enough for it to begin to work its way from here down into our hearts. I know that that can be a struggle for me sometimes because there's a lot to do. There's a lot to accomplish. There's a lot to get done. But if I'm always hustling, I can quickly be hustling for the wrong reasons. And I can quickly have peace stolen. And I'm hustling and the cycle goes on and on and on. Sometimes we have to sit down so that we can marinate in truth so that we can believe it. We have to believe. And this is the message that we see in Hebrews chapter 3. And four. In, in these two chapters, um, we see the writer of Hebrews use the Israelites, the nation of Israel, as they're being brought by the Lord into the promised land. He uses them as an example for us. And he uses that picture of the Israelites standing out on the edge of the promised land, waiting to come in, you know, waiting to come into that, that place of peace, that place of shalom, that place where they're going to be at home and at rest. But something stopped them from entering in. And what is it? Well, the thing that stopped them from entering in was they saw giants, they saw scary stuff, and all of a sudden they questioned something about God. So once again, we see that a lack of believing or a counter-narrative can keep us from entering into rest. And so in, in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, we read this. God's promise of entering his rest still stands. Amen, right? So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For the good news that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them. But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. For only we who believe can enter his rest. Only we who believe can enter his rest. The Israelites were looking over this good land, looking over this place of peace, this home, their heart's true home in a sense, and they got stopped from entering in because of a lie that they believed about God. But in verse 4, oh, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, what we already read, we hear this. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors, just as God did after creating the world. So let us strive to enter that rest. It's only those who believe that can enter into this rest. I believe it's only those who look upon the mystery and the scandal of the cross and say, yep, that settles it. That's it, right there. He loves me. He's for me all the time even on my worst day. Whether I have letters after my name or not, whether I got all A's in my seminary degree or not, 
Whether I accomplish all that I set out to in his name or not, he loves me. And I'm secure in his love. And I believe in the scandal of this love. And I put the full force of my believing in this love. I will rest in this love and I will not let any counter narrative dislodge me from this place of faith and believing. I think that's what it looks like to believe. And we do that right now, but then we do that 20 minutes from now. And then we do that again later this afternoon. And then we do that later again this evening where we continually refresh ourselves in the truth of the mystery of the scandal of the cross that your worth and my worth is found there in the declaration of the Father's love, in the declaration of the fact that we are his. I just want to ask you this. Do you feel like you have peace this morning? Or is it possible that there's a counter-narrative that's robbing you of peace? I hope that you all are sitting here in his presence full of peace. But if you're not, I wonder if the Spirit of God would raise to our awareness what it is that could be robbing us of peace. Is there a whisper? Is there something that is being said to us that is stealing our peace? There are four things that I think we can do to, to help walk through this. I think the first is recognizing if we do have a lack of peace. St. Ignatius spoke often or wrote often about being attentive to our, the internal movements of our heart, just having an awareness of what's going on in there. So like if there's not peace there, having an awareness of it can move us on to the next thing, which is recognizing the lie that's driving that lack of peace. And then simple repentance, coming home. Jesus, I've been believing this silly thing. I want to come to you and I, I want to do what Adam and Eve did. I want to find out if this is true. And if it's not, will you tell me what's really true about you? And I want to be renewed. I want to be refreshed in that vision. I want to close by reading a quote by Brother Lawrence. And I want to invite you, if you would, to close your eyes as I read this over you. Brother Lawrence is writing this, this as a letter to a friend who asked about his inner spiritual life. And... He's kind of closing out this letter. And he says, I want to tell you how I sometimes imagine myself before the Lord. And I'm certain that Brother Lawrence isn't speaking in hyperbole. Like he's really like, this is how I sometimes close my eyes and imagine myself before the Lord. This is something that I do. Sometimes I close my eyes and I meditate on this thought and I refresh myself in this vision of who God is and who I am to him. And so I, I just want to lean into Brother Lawrence's imagination, and I want to ask that he, the Holy Spirit in this room, might sanctify our imaginations and might refresh us with the vision of God that could restore our hearts to peace. Walter Brueggemann talks about the importance of having prophetic imagination, being able to have divine sight, to see that which is really, really real. And I believe that what Brother Lawrence shares with us is from the Lord, and it's really, really real. So if you would, if you feel comfortable, just close your eyes and allow, allow this to come alive in your own imagination. Brother Lawrence writes, In short, I am assured beyond any doubt that my soul has been with God for nearly 30 years. I've not shared all my accounts of this with you so as not to bore you, but I think that it is proper that I tell you what manner I imagine myself before God, whom I behold as king. I imagine myself as the most wretched of all, full of sores and sins, and one who has committed all sorts of crimes against his king. Feeling a deep sorrow, I confess to him all my sins, I ask his forgiveness, and I, abandon my, and I abandon myself into his hands, so that he may do with me what he pleases. This king, full of mercy and goodness, very far from chastening me, embraces me with love, invites me to feast at his table, 
serves me with his own hands and gives me the key to his treasures. He converses with me and takes delight in me and treats me as if I were his favorite. This is how I imagine myself from time to time in his holy presence. Jesus, may we be able to see ourselves in the same way. Father, no wonder Brother Lawrence had such uninterrupted joy in your presence that he could see at the same time his own brokenness and your own tenderness towards him. Father, I pray that you would refresh us with a vision of what you're like. Refresh us with the truths that the cross declares into our hearts, that you are for us, that you came and sought us out, that you're with us, and that there's nothing that can separate us from Thank you. 
Yeah. <laughs>